Bhakti Siddhanta says that he can't pull Srila Prabhupada's ki, yay, and that the Gopi Vishnu did the ki, yay. Now Acharya Srila Haridas Thakur ki, yay. He came to the whole Sri Krishna Sri Sangha Sadhuna Jana, and Sri Vatarita Vinad Narasi Asadi Kora Bhaktivinda ki, yay. Sri Sri Radha Krishna's Gopi Gopi Nam Shantam Radha Krishna Sri Govardhan ki, yay. Sri Vrindavan Dhamma ki, yay. Sri Mayapur Sangha Dhamma ki, yay. Sri Jagannath Puri Dhamma ki, yay. Yay, Yamuna Mai Ki, Yay, Sri Devi Ki, Yay, Bhakti Devi Ki, Yay, Sri Harinam Sankirtan Ki, Yay, Sri Sri Radha Gopi Balava Ki, Yay, Sri Sri Jagannath Baldeshwar Bhakti Mahavani Ki, Yay, Sri Sri Bodhisattva Ki, Yay, Sri Sri Bhagavad Ki, Yay, Rama Veda Bhakti Vrta Ki, Yay, Guru Prema Nande Hari Ki, All Glories to the Sacred Devotee, Yay, All Glories to the Sacred Devotee, Yay, All Glories to the Sacred Devotee, Yay. All glories to Shri Shri Guru, Shri Goranda, all glories to Shri Atopa. Hare Krishna, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you for everyone online who's joined. So today, I wanted to speak on this topic. It's called a revolutionary understanding of God. Nowadays, we have to use the word God with a lot of caution. Yes. It can conjure up various types of images. Some people think God is uh, a strict and unforgiving judge. Others think God is an old man seated on a throne that hurls thunderbolts anytime somebody goes out of line. Others think God is a crutch for the weak and the unfortunate to walk on. Others may think God is just an imagination, an imaginary being who brings peace and hope and comfort. Others still think that God is a, this mythical conjured up idea that the power hungry elite have put in place so they can control the masses. And others think God is just a cosmic order supply, a portal call whenever you need something. So people who believe the, these statements, they can even what they can do is they can also point out the shlokas in the Gita to prove their to prove this stereotypical understanding of God. For example, in the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna says, Arjuna Vajra, Param Brahma, Param Brahma, Pavitram, Param Bhavana, Purusham Shashvatam Devyam, Adi Devam, Najam Vibra. He is praying to Krishna that, Krishna, you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the ultimate abode, the purest, the absolute truth. You are eternal, transcendental, the original person, the unborn, the greatest. Yeah, so this verse from the Bhagavad Gita helps establish that Krishna is the ultimate abode, the absolute truth, the original person, the greatest of all time. This is rooted in the stereotypical understanding of God. In other places, we start to understand Krishna as the all opulent. In the beginning, in the preface of the Krishna book, Srila Prabhupada writes that one, from practical experience, he, this is what he writes, we can observe that one is attracted due to wealth, power, fame, beauty, wisdom, and renunciation. One who is in possession of all these six opulences at the same time, who possesses them to an unlimited degree, is understood to be the personality of God. So God is known to have all of these qualities in full, in full of unlimited opulence, all simultaneously. Again, in the Gita, in the 11th chapter, Krishna reveals his universal form. And Arjuna says, all all pervading Vishnu, seeing you with your many radiant colors touching the sky, your gaping mouths, and your great glowing eyes, my mind is perturbed by fear. I can no longer maintain my steadiness or equilibrium of mind. So it's interesting. Arjuna is a Kshatriya. He can behold sight of 
mutilated corpses on the battlefield. He can behold sight of rivers of blood flowing in the battlefield. And yet, when he sees this unlimited form of Krishna, he starts to become very fearful. We, so this point establishes that God is someone who is very fearful, who has a very, you know, difficult to behold form of the universal form is very, it, it gives us shivers down our spine. Again, contributing to this stereotypical understanding of God, that God is all powerful, all fearful. And he is also someone that gives us direction. In chapter 2, Arjuna again says, Karpanya dosho bahata sobhava prichan tam dharma samutta chitaha yachreya syanish chitam puru vitam me shishya te hamsha di makvam prapannam. Arjuna prays to Krishna that I am confused about my duty. I have lost all composure because of my misery weakness. In this condition, Arjuna is asking Krishna to tell him for certain what is best for Arjuna, what is best for him. Arjuna says, I am now your disciple, a soul surrendered onto you. Please instruct me. So we see God as someone who gives us direction, who helps us in the time of need, who gives us the way, who advises us accordingly. And we also see God as someone who rewards us with prosperity if we worship him. Prosperity in health, in wealth, and in life in general when he's happy with us. We think this is God's grace, or we can interpret this to be God's grace. That if you worship God in a certain way, he will bestow all opulence on you. And this is also can be pulled from the Bhagavad Gita. Ye yathamam prapadyente tamstateva vajamiyaham mama vartamanu vartante manushya parta sarvashaha. So in this verse, Krishna is saying to Arjuna that as all surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects, O son of Pritha. So when we look at the Bhagavad Gita in these isolated shlokas, in one way we can see how Bhagavad Gita supports this stereotypical understanding of God who is all powerful, all fearful, all knowledgeable, can give us opulence, can reward us in certain ways. Right? And this is not too far off from what is the understanding of God in the Jewish faith, in the Islamic faith, in the Christian faith as well. So this stereotypical understanding of God gives us a relationship of awe and reverence with him. But there is an issue. The issue is that this relationship that we have of God, with God based on this understanding of awe and reverence is based on fear. And what does that mean? That means if I do not worship God, I will not get prosperity. If I do not worship God, I will ultimately be destroyed, just as how the Kaurava army was destroyed by Krishna. If I do not worship God, I will be lost. It's based on fear rather than on love and devotion. And then the question comes, that is this all God? Is this all who God is? Is he a fearful, powerful, attention-hungry being seated on a throne in the heavens that delivers judgment for mortals? Is this what God is like? Is this what God likes? Is this what God wants? And this is where the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya or the Gaudiya Vaishnava theology the spiritual understanding or the spiritual foundation that Srila Prabhupada has propounded as in and is being followed by Islam, that is where this understanding comes into play. So Srila Prabhupada, he stressed the study of three scriptures. The first scripture was Bhagavad Gita, aka the words of God, also known as words of God. So it is Bhagavad Gita is considered the foundational study in spiritual conclusions. It is the word of God and it firmly establishes the essential philosophical truths. In other words, if you pull these verses from the Gita, one may mistakenly 
think Krishna or understand Krishna or God only to be the all powerful, the all knowledgeable, the all opulent, the person who rewards us accordingly. So, in one way, Bhagavad Gita does support the stereotypical understanding of God. But we need to understand that this understanding that God is all of these things, and that is just the partial understanding. When we start to look at the Bhagavad Gita comprehensively, then we actually start to appreciate the holistic understanding of God. Then the next book that Srila Prabhupada recommended was the Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is details the activities of God. It takes this understanding, the stereotypical understanding that is presented in the Bhagavad Gita and further expands on it. It is therefore considered a graduate study, one step up. It contains the narrations of God that describe the enchanting character of Krishna and his saintly devotee. So through the Srimad Bhagavatam, our understanding of God deepens a little bit more. But then it comes the third book. So the first book was Gita, it gives us the initial understanding of God. Second book was Srimad Bhagavatam that further expands and talks about the activities of God. But then the third book is the Chaitanya Charitamrita. And the Chaitanya Charitamrita is considered the postgraduate study in spirituality. And what this book does is Bhagavad Gita reveals words of God. Srimad Bhagavatam talks about the activities of God. But the Chaitanya Charitamrita reveals the inner mind of God. What is God actually thinking? It reveals the inner life of God, the inner life of Krishna, and the appreciation and attraction that Krishna feels when he is conquered by the love of his devotees. That is explained in the Srimad, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. So by basing our understanding just on the Bhagavad Gita, and even that just on the isolated verses of the Gita, we are actually doing ourselves an injustice. Because even though God being perceived as the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the person who delivers judgment, that may be one understanding of God, but it's just a partial understanding of God. We have other scriptures, the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Chaitanya Charitamrit, that deepen our understanding of God and actually reveal who God is in, the, in his entirety. And so we should actually, if we do not take advantage of these other scriptures, then yes, we are doing ourselves an injustice because our Acharya, Srila Prabhupada, has brought these scriptures for us to get an understanding way beyond what is offered by any other spiritual or religious path. Which other book can tell us or reveal to us the inner mind of God, what he's actually thinking? A lot of the books, and to some degree, even the Bhagavad Gita, it talks about the words of God, but it doesn't reveal what Krishna is actually thinking behind what he's saying. But the Chaitanya Chaitanya goes there. It tells us what the Lord is thinking. And what his inner emotions are. But I still haven't answered the question. The question was so, is God just a fearful, powerful, attention hungry being delivering judgment for mortals? Does he just want to be the center of attention? And the answer to that, as you may have guessed, is no. It's a simple no. And this is what's revealed in Chaitanya Chaitanya See, it's interesting. Everyone in the world is trying to be God. We see what's happening in Europe. It's one being's, one man's a drive to dictate the life of an entire country. He's, in one way, they're just trying to play God. So, so many of us in our own little way are trying to be God. And who does God want to be? He wants to be his devotee. He actually just wants to give up being God and become a devotee. And not just a devotee, but the servant of a devotee. And this is the most confidential understanding, the most confidential aspect of God. And this con super confidential aspect of God 
is revealed in the Chaitanya Chaitanya. The book that is written by Srila Krishna Das Kaviraj that describes the activities of a personality called Sri Krishna Chaitanya or Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or Lord Baranga. So we see that through Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is none other than Krishna himself, we are exposed to this most confidential aspect of God. For those who don't know who Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was, I'm sure most people do, but just for um, just to state it, he was actually God himself. So actually, uh, I just remembered in the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is written before the time of Lord Chaitanya, just pulling up the verse. It is described that it, all the uh, which is revealed, which is written before the time of Lord Chaitanya, all of God's incarnations are described. And actually, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, they also mention the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu even before his actual appearance. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared about 500 years ago, so maybe in the 15th century or the 16th century. And of course, Srimad Bhagavatam was written about 5,000 years ago. So in the Chitan, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it says here, Krishna Varnam Trisha Krishna Sanko Pangashtra Parshadam Yagya Isti Sankirtane Prayer Vijanti Hi Sumedha Sata. So in the age of Kali, intelligence is mentioned that intelligent people will take to the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra and will actually worship and follow the footsteps of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is none other than Krishna himself. So we have actual scriptural backing of this, the fact that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is actually Krishna. And of course, that's a different topic on why or uh, how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or the evidence behind Chaitanya Mahaprabhu being Krishna. But just for the sake of this discussion, we'll leave it at that and we'll say that no, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in fact God himself, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. Appearing in the mood of the devotee. So now let's take a little bit, let's take this a little bit further. Why would Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is God himself, or why would God appear as a devotee? What his and not just any devotee, his own devotee. Why would God take up that position? And the answer to this question is, is because Krishna is recognizing that his devotees are experiencing much more pleasure being his devotee than he is as God. Now let's take that a little, let's dissect that a little more. Krishna is known to be the ultimate enjoyer, yes? Which means that he is enjoying to a degree we cannot even fathom. But Krishna's devotees are enjoying and experiencing bliss even higher than, him, than Krishna himself. Think about that. That's how Krishna gets it. When he hears that, he has an identity crisis. He says, I am supposed to be God, which means that I'm supposed to be the ultimate in every respect, which means I'm supposed to be enjoying. I'm supposed to be the ultimate enjoyer. Yet, how do my devotees, how are they enjoying much more than I, I am? And so to reconcile that identity crisis, Krishna comes down as Lord Chaitanya to experience the happiness and the bliss that his devotees are experiencing. So the presence of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is proof that God is not an attention seeker. He is not an egomaniac who's just trying, who's just concerned with him getting worship. The proof is that. God does not want to be God. God wants to be what to descend and experience the bliss of being a devotee. He wants to give that up and he and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the proof of that, where God himself descends, leaves his position as God and becomes his own devotee. Therefore, the, this understanding of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, that God has come down in his own as his own devotee is actually incredibly advanced theological understanding. Because as I said, if we try to analyze any other school of thought, any other theology, any other spiritual path, 
none of them or none that I have ever experienced talk about how God is coming to become his own devotee. He's not coming as an expansion. He's not coming as an extension. He's coming as himself to experience the bliss of being his devotee. It's like this. Imagine a billionaire who had a mansion and he had servants or he or she had servants working for them. But the servants were treated with such love care and care and attention that the servants are enjoying more than the billionaire. So the billionaire renounces his billions of dollars just so that he could experience what his servants are experiencing. It's completely revolutionary if you think about it. So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So the first point was that, just to summarize so far, that the stereotypical understanding of God is that God is all-powerful, all-knowledgeable, all-knowing. Yes, this is one understanding, but it's only a partial understanding. The deeper understanding is that God is not just all-powerful, all-knowledgeable, all-knowing. It's that he actually wants to renounce his position as God and come down as a devotee. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is a practical representation or practical example of that irrefutable fact. So how does Chaitanya Mahaprabhu actually demonstrate this? I've told you that he is a proof. So now you're like, okay, tell me how he demonstrates this. Show me examples where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu practically demonstrated this revolutionary understanding of God. So let's take it one by one. So the first, or the first sort of uh, example, one sort of characteristic, or one principle of the stereotypical understanding of God is that God is the one who shows us the way. People go to God for answers when there's so many. I know I have. I come in front of Krishna and I said, "I'm having so many problems in my life. What do I do?" We saw from the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna himself, Kalpanya Dosho Bhata Sobhava. He said. I've lost all composure. I don't know what's good for me. Krishna, you please tell me what is the best for me. I am now your disciple. So, yes, we go to God for answers to our problems. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, what did he do? He went to his devotee for answers. So in the year 1510, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he took sannyas. And after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, Okay. <laughs> so after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took sannyas, he asked from he met he went to the Godavari and at the Godavari he met one of his devotees. His name was Ramananda Rai. And to Ramananda Rai he asks, Can you reveal to me the ultimate goal of life? We usually ask this question to God. God, what is my ultimate goal? What is my purpose? But here is God asking Ramananda Rai, please reveal to me the ultimate goal of life. So Ramananda Rai starts to explain a few things. And then what does Chaitanya Mahaprabhu do? Say, he says, Prabhu Kohe, Eho Bahai, Eho Bahaya, Age Kaha Ar, which means, this is all external. Please proceed and tell me more. So Ramananda Rai goes again, and then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says again, Enho bhaya age kara kaha ar, which again means that this is all external. Please go further, go deeper. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu keeps on urging Ramananda Rai to go deeper, deeper, deeper. And like this, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu reveals the ultimate method of worship and the deepest truth of Vaishnava philosophy simply by how by asking his disciple question, by asking him, what, please reveal the highest truths to me. So this is again very interesting, where instead of the disciple asking God, what is the ultimate goal of life? God is asking his, his devotee, you please tell me what is the ultimate goal of life? Yes? Another understanding of God is, no one who gives us instruction. So we go to God, we ask him, 
please tell us, um, you know, what is your instruction for me? Oh, please pass on the cash. Yes, my dear Lord. I will do this. Please chant 16 then. Yes, my dear Lord, I will do this. But then, in the case of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, what did he do? So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu meets this other sannyasi called Prakashananda Saraswati. Prakashananda Saraswati, when he meets Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's completely baffled because he thinks to himself, here is a sannyasi, and all he's doing is running, is jumping around, dancing, and chanting the holy names of God. I mean, a sannyasi should be studying Vedanta. That's what a sannyasi does. So Prakashananda Saraswati is completely baffled by the activities of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he asked, Prakashananda Saraswati asks Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that why are you simply chanting the holy name? Why aren't you studying Vedanta? In Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, what does he reply to Prakashananda Saraswati? Prabhu kahe shuno shripa dhimhara karan guru more murtha deki karila shasha. So the translation is, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu replied to Prakashananda Saraswati, My dear sir, kindly hear the reason. My spiritual master considered me a fool, and therefore he chastised me. Then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, this is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is Krishna, and he's saying, My spiritual master considered me a fool. And then he continues, he says, Murka tumi tumar nahika vedanta adhikar krishna mantra chape sada e mantra ka. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu continues, he says, his spiritual master, Ishwara Puri, told him, You are a fool, you're not qualified to study the Vedanta philosophy, and therefore you must always chant the holy name of Krishna. This is the essence of all mantras of Vedic hymns. So Ishwara Puri, he was, and I think, I believe it's his appearance day today as well. So he is the spiritual master of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And what is he doing to the Supreme Personality of Godhead? He's chastising him. He's not just that, chastising him like, oh, I think, you know, maybe you're not, uh, maybe you just study, you should chant the mantra. He's calling, he's saying, you are the fool. You have you you you're not qualified to study the Vedanta philosophy. Please always chant the holy name of Krishna. This is a very if you, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is actually enjoying this, is relishing this sweet exchange between his spiritual master and himself as his disciple. He's actually relishing this. Why? Because again, it goes back to that point. For his pure devotees, God actually wants to relinquish the position of being God and accept the mood of a devotee. It's amazing. People are going to God for advice. They're going to God for answers. And here God, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's going to each for a puri and completely being chastised by him. And is being, is, is being given an explicit instruction by his own devotees. And then what does Chaitanya Mahaprabhu tell Ishwara Puri once he receives the mantra? Kiba mantra diya goshai, kiba tara bal, japite japite mantra, karila pagal. He's saying, my dear Lord, what kind of mantra have you given me? I have become mad simply by chanting this Maha mantra. So some people may wonder, you always chant this Hare Krishna Maha mantra repeatedly, repeatedly, wherever I go work. Whatever festivals it is, even greeting, we say Hare Krishna. Why? It's because the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one, himself chanted this mantra, and two, he experienced such bliss from chanting this mantra. He says, Japite, Japite mantra, Karila Becoming mad by chanting this Maha mantra. So again, we see this is a completely revolutionary understanding that God. Is supposed to be someone who is prime and proper and controlled and you know. But here God is chanting the Maha Mantra and he's losing all sense of control on his mind and his emotions. Then we'll see later on Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when he writes the Shikshastakam, he says the he writes in there the emotions that he's feeling 
when chanting the holy names of the Lord, tears are running down my eyes like torrents of rain. So this is, again, this is a completely revolutionary understanding that we see in the Chaitanya Chaitamrita, where God himself is revealing his mind, he's revealing his emotion. Something that we don't see in the Bhagavad Gita or, and, or even really, we really don't get to it. We get some glimpses of it in the Bhagavatam, but in the Chaitanya Chaitamrita, it really comes to fruition, where we start to understand God in the world. Another thing is, what's another stereotypical understanding of God is that he's always one who is feared, someone who is very fearful, someone that everyone fears, right? We, in fact, have so many different rituals and superstitions that we perform because we fear God. We fear that if I don't do this, something bad will happen. So generally in the world, people fear God. God will strike me, I will have to atone for it. This is the general concept. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he shows us a deeper understanding. He shows us that God is actually fearful of his devotion. And the example is the interaction between his mother and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is outside. And as a child, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was playing with his little childhood friend. So his mother, Sachi Mata, brought him some sweets and asked the children to sit down and eat. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, what does he do? He starts to eat the dirt. And of course, when Sachi Mata noticed that he's eating the dirt, she became very angry at him. She became quite upset. Right? And she chastised Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And then what happened? It's written here. Sachi Mata says, Dekhi Sachi Dhan, Aila Kari, Haya Haya, Mati Kadi Lana Kahe, Mati Kene Khaya. Seeing this, Mother Sachi hastily returned and explained, What is this? What is this? She snatched the dirt from the hands of Chetan of the Lord and inquired why he was eating it. And so, this is the interaction that happens between Sachi Mata and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Again, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Lord. From him comes Lord Narsimhadev, and Narsimhadev is the is described to be Mrityu Mrityu Namami Aham, the death of that personified. And his mother is coming and snatching away the dirt from his hand, and experiencing the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu start, begins to cry. He begins to cry. He gets shaken up by his mother. I mean, this is the supreme personality of Godhead. Again, his expansion is Lord Nishinga today, who's the death of death personified. With the Sudarshan Chakra, he can immediately touch off, like, let alone human, but even higher planetary beings, he can immediately vanquish them. And he's shaken up because his mother is simply just chastising him. So we can see the general concept of God. People are fearful of God, but in Gaudiya, the Gaudiya understanding of God, God is fearful of his devotees. And of course, today, because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance day is coming up, we're going to have a program in the temple, uh, March 17th, I believe. Thursday. Yeah, Thursday, March 17th. So we like to, we are trying to focus and trying to build a meditation ahead of that day. But this understanding is also given through the example of Lord Krishna himself. We're focusing on the Leela of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, but even in Krishna Leela, we can see how Krishna is subservient to his devotees. He is also showing by his personal example that he is presenting a completely revolutionary understanding of God. In the month of Kartik, we sing Damodarastakam. Damodarastakam is signifying the pastime or glorifying the pastime where Mother Yashoda binds for Krishna with the robe. And the second verse of that song is Rutandam Muhur Nesra Yukma Vijantam Param Boja Yukmena Sutanka Nesram Muhu Swasa Kampa Kri Dekha Katanta Sita Kriva Damo Daram The translation is upon seeing the whipping stick in his mother's hand or his mother's whipping stick, he who is Krishna. 
cried and rubbed his eyes again and again with his two lotus hands. And then get this, his eyes were fearful and his breathing quick. And as his mother and as Mother Yashoda bound his belly with ropes, he shivered in fright and his pearl necklace shook. So again, we see that Krishna as Lord Damodar is becoming fearful of his devotee. He becomes being subservient of his devotee. This is the same Krishna who is showing this unlimited form that all the army on both sides, the Korvas and the Pandavas side, is, are rushing into his mouth, is getting killed by his feet. And yet, when he sees the whipping stick in his mother's hand, he is not just scared. It's not, the it's written here, he's shivering in fright. He is not being scared is one thing, but shivering in fright, that's a whole different level of fear. He's experiencing fear to that degree through, through his devotee or because of his devotee. So the point is that while God is all-powerful, he is all-knowledgeable. He is all fearful, delivers the final judgment. These are characteristics of God, but that is not all what God is. God is so much more than that. He is so much more than that. When we look at the Gita, when we look at the Srimad Bhagavatam, when we look at the Chaitanya Chaitanya and we study these scriptures with devotion, with intention, we see the pastimes of the Lord as Krishna and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. There, we start to develop a very deep understanding of God, and we start to see how loving and caring and sensitive God is. Right? When we chant the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, we always say chant with attention, chant with focus. The reason why we say these things is because. On the other end of this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is God Himself waiting to receive us with both with both arms, waiting to receive us with utmost warmth and care. But we ourselves are blocking our access to Him. It's not when I and I'll make a confession. When I first started chanting, I was like, if I don't chant with focus or with determination, then I'm going to get struck down. By God in some way, shape, or form. Of course, that is a completely like you know naive outward understanding. We chant with focus and attention so that because we are standing our own way from receiving the love and the care that is waiting for us from Krishna on the other side. So this is this is it that when the stereotypical understanding of God. It's just a partial understanding of God. The deeper understanding of, of God is that God is, while everyone else is trying to become God, God is actually trying to become his devotee. He's actually trying to become subservient to his devotee. So this, I, I see it's, I have until six. Yeah, okay. So the summary for today is as follows. The stereotypical understanding of God does not allow us to have a relationship with God that is based on love and devotion. Rather, it encourages a relationship with God that is based on fond reference. While this understanding is better than no understanding of God, it's still a step up. The Gaudiya vision of philosophy expands on this understanding and gives us to the deeper understanding of God, which allows us to have a relationship with him that's based on love and devotion. It allows us to have a relationship with God that is dynamic, that is loving, that is ecstatic. And a practical example of this is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself, who is Krishna appearing on this planet to establish the irrefutable, transcendental, absolutely intimate understanding of God, that God is just not this that God is really just trying to become subservient to his devotees. He's actually anxious to become subservient to his devotees. 
And we give three examples of this. The examples was the first one is the stereotypical understanding of God is someone who shows us the way. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is asking Ramananda Rai, show me the way. The stereotypical understanding of God is someone who gives us instruction. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is asking Ishwara, Prabhu, uh, Ishwara Puri, please give me instruction. And not just giving, he's not just asking him to give instruction, but he's following that instruction to the T. The stereotypical understanding of God is that someone who is feared in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's crying, he's fearful of his mother, such as Mata. So while we do not negate the understanding that God is all powerful, all fearful, all knowing, we do expand on that understanding and see that God is anxious to become subservient to his devotee and accept his devotee as his master. One of my favorite verses from the Chaitanya Chaitanya is that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu again, God himself is saying this, that I'm not a Brahman, I'm not a Kshatriya, I'm not a Vaishya, I'm not a Sutra. So the four Varnas are out. Then he says, nor am I a Brahmachari, a householder, a Vanaprasa, a Nesanyasi. So all the ashrams are out. So he's rejected all the Varna ashram. He says, I identify myself only. He identifies himself only as the servant of the servant of the servant of the lotus feet of Lord Krishna, the maintainer of the devotee. So he's not even saying, I am a devotee. He's saying, I'm the servant of the servant of the devotee of Krishna. That's his only understanding. And this is the revolutionary understanding of God. That God is anxious to become the servant of his devotee. And with that, I would like to end. We have nine minutes. Um, if there are any questions or comments, please, the much more senior vegetables in the audience who can speak more about this topic. But yeah, if there are any questions or comments, please, please share. Otherwise, we can repeat them for nine minutes. So uh, it's always something that Hare Krishna Mahamantra is the way back to God. And how I at least imagine it in my head is that a person is suffering in a very path or something like that, in a very in a state which is not meant to be in. Like the example is even a fish or the water. But when you are chanting, you are not able to feel the sensation of the water when you are going to that. So What's the end of the That's a that's a wonderful question. Thank you so much for asking that. Um, I will try to answer it to the best of my ability. But first, I have to make the disclaimer that I do not feel like the fish in the water as well when I can. So I'm not at that level yet. But so just to summarize the question is that. Hare Krishna Mahamantra is explained to revert us back to our original identity in our original environment. Like right now, we are and we are we have taken up an imposed identity and in, in a very artificial environment that is actually bringing about suffering. The so Hare Krishna Mahamantra is supposed to revert that and put us back into our original environment. But when we are chanting, we do not feel that. So where's the issue? So the, we have to. So one point is this: the Hare Krishna Mahamantra is gen, the one of the other analogies that is given, along with what you said, like a fish out of the water. The other analogy that Shri gives is that it is also like taking sugarcane juice for someone who is suffering with jaundice, right? When someone is suffering with jaundice and they take sugarcane juice, in the beginning it feels very bitter. But the more they take it, the more it will start to taste sweet as they will recover from that. So that's the first understanding. First understanding is that, yes, this is supposed to help us get back into our original state. But the first question we should ask ourselves is that at what stage of our chanting is that supposed to happen? Is it an immediate or is it later? The second point we need to understand is that. Uh, Again, if this intervention 
is supposed to help us revert back to our original state. Are we implementing this intervention in the right way and actually being able to harness all its potency? So that's the second point, and that is more so for us, is that are we actually chanting with the right intention, in the right mind, at the right I mean, time of day, and to what, and like all of these things, right? So the first thing is like, again, first point is like, how long will that happen? Second, are we doing it properly? And the other thing about the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is that in Sri Rangam, if you if we go to Sri Rangam, this analogy is given by a uh, very powerful devotee. He says in Sri Rangam, there are three doors. The first door opens, like we have to open it. It opens this way. The second door also opens as, you know, we have to sort of open it. But the third door, the third door is the door to right to the deities. And that one actually opens from inside out. The, and the, and what, what he means by that is that we can try to align ourselves physically to harness the potency of the Maha Mantra. We can try to align ourselves, uh, you can say mentally, to get the benefit of the Maha Mantra. But to get the ultimate benefit of the Maha Mantra, that has to, the third door has to open from Krishna himself. That when Krishna awards us that potency, only at that point will we actually feel that deep, that uh, deep sense of relief that you're de describing. So that is from a theoretical sort of perspective, what I have read. Now I'll tell you from the practical perspective. The practical perspective is the rule that, first of all, I myself do not remember what I what a fish in water feels like. I have been out of the water for so long that I have actually forgotten what that feels like. So when I try to do a process that helps me put back, that helps me put myself back into my original position, what I think is my original position, because I've forgotten what that feels like, actually feels artificial. So in the beginning, it is going to be artificial because I've actually forgotten. And the second thing is, while I may not, while I may not for a prolonged period of time feel that relief, I can guarantee you that for the if I'm chanting even sixty, if I'm chanting sixteen rounds, at least for one second, I will feel such great relief, even if it's for a millisecond, that will give me enough faith to understand yes, something is waiting for me on the other end. So the analogy that I like to think, and this is again, I don't know whether this is, this is just, I'm telling you what I experience. Please do not quote me on this. There's no Shastric evidence of this. But the other analogy I like to think to myself is that what you're, the question is that, imagine if you're going on, on a dark road and they say that if you follow this path, there's the destination that awaits you, but you only have a candle light. So what do you do? You take one step forward and you see that, oh, there's a path in front of you. So you take another step forward. Oh, there's another path in front of you. You may not see the full goal at the end, but if you keep on taking little, little steps, that those little steps will give you enough faith to help you understand that, no, at the end, this goal is waiting for me. And that is what, and for me, I'm just looking for those, at the mercy of Krishna, I'm just looking for those my small, tiny steps. And that is enough for me to understand that, you know, at the end, there is. I mean, Prabhu, and Nityananda Trayotasi, he had that wonderful seat, and if you were here, that in itself should give us enough <laughs> understanding that, oh, yes, this Mahamantra will be established in my original state of Sat Chit Ananda. Right? So, I would say from, yeah, so anyways, those are two, some thoughts, but if anyone else would like to add to it. I hope that was okay. Any other questions or comments, criticisms? Yes. Hare Krishna. Oh. 
లిటరేచర్ <laughs> ప్రభుజీ <laughs> yeah so the question was so the question was that while we understand the moon that's okay i'll just i'll just shout really loudly we have another button so the question was that while we have this mood of chanting the holy name what should be a mood for a sadhaka when reading shri prabhupada scripture or when reading the Vedic scriptures or Sri Aparupad's books. So in 20, a few years ago, I had this question for a devotee from um, the UK. And this is what he shared with me and I'll share with you. So he told me, okay, I don't have to shout. Okay. So, this devotee, I asked him this very same question. First of all, thank you so much for that one. Thank you so much Prabhu, for that wonderful question. It's really, really insightful. Um, so I'll tell you again, the theoretical and then I'll tell you the practical. So the theoretical should be that, and Shri Prabhupada has said this, that we should study his books just as a lawyer studies his law books. I'm, I have a healthcare background, so I know how um, scrutinizingly, I would study my um, medical and my pharmaceutical textbooks. Every sort of, I, to the point where, like, you know, sometimes in an exam, I could pick, when I would get asked a question, I could picture the page where that information was written and I'd be able to recall it. So that is the, that is to the, uh, to the intensity by which we should be studying Shura Prabhupada's books. Of course, this is the ideal, so that we can quote, and there are uh, individuals in our movement. I remember I was talking to this devotee, and I quoted one line from a purport of the Bhagavatam, and he was able to give me the verse number, the Sanskrit text, the translation, the entire purport, what came before and after, all of that. So there are individuals in the movement who have really taken time to study Shabbat's books. I'll tell you now that is the ideal. If you're there already or on your way there, wonderful Prabhu, please help me. <laughs> please bless me so I can get there. But I'll tell you where I am. I for me, the personally what has helped me is just a deep sense of gratitude for what your Prabhupada is giving in his books. Just so Srila Prabhupada. It was this, I was listening to a lecture. He was in Vrindavan before he came to America. He would go for Mahadukari. Okay. So I would go, I would, he would, I would go to Madhukari. In Madhukari, he would go and beg. I'll just quickly because uh, we have to start party. He would go to Madhukari and he would beg. He would beg for food. And you know, Madhukari, you beg for food. But instead of begging for food, he would beg for hastas and householders. For pen and paper. When someone would bring him dal and sabji, he would say, Please, no, you keep that. Please give me pen and paper so that I could write the commentary of the Sriman Bhagavatam on it. Prabhupada was literally begging for pen and paper so he could write the Srimad Bhagavatam for us. So if someone who is begging for pen and paper so that he could write a book so that I could read it, that is for me, that's so much, like, I just try to incorporate that move that Prabhupada, I'm so grateful for you for giving us this knowledge, for taking so much trouble to give us this knowledge. And this is the least I can do, is just read your books. That's the absolute least, let alone study, let alone the least I could do is just read your books. So that is my personal practice, is I try to read in the mood of gratitude, to be grateful for Prabhupada, and try to also remember what I've read and apply it in my life, especially if something strikes me. And hopefully one day I can get maybe I can get to a stage where I can properly study Shri Prabhupada's books. 
and you know change my character. So with that, thank you very much, Prabhu. I hope that answers your question. Wow, thank you, Prabhu Hari Krishna. Thank you so much. Thank you for the nice answer.
राधाकुंडवर्धन भगवान की गंगा माए की यमुना माए की श्री श्री जगन्नाथपुर धाम की जगन्नाथ बलदेव सुभद्र महारानी की श्री श्री राधा कपि बल्लभ भगवान की श्री श्री गौर निकाय की श्री श्री विष्णुद भगवान की पंचदत्त की श्री श्री तुलसी महारानी की और प्रमंत हरि हरि और क्लर्स के समुंद्र में 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 दो रंग Namaste, 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 Namaste.
before the Sunday is at the temple in person. We have Saturday and Sunday full day uh, Anyone can come here. Uh, and Sunday we have on Saturday we have Saturday night Kirtan in person. We have so many Kirtanists yesterday. We had a wonderful, wonderful Kirtan yesterday. And again we are going to have uh, uh, next Saturday. We are hoping and expecting Many devotees on uh, next Saturday, so please come for the Saturday night. Return. That's also one more opportunity for you to come to the temple. Since we have been away from the temple for so long, so make the most of it. Like whatever we have lost, it. so try to fill in with all this. Like take it, take it as much as you can, and come come to the temple as much as you can. Now, now we are open. We are opened up for anybody and everybody. We just only thing, only uh, restriction or only request we have is wear the mask. That's it. 
And on Sunday feast in the evening, uh, we have all this Sunday feast program. So please do come for that. For that. We would like to see uh, the temple hall filled with all the devotees. And since all the devotees are missing this Sunday feast and the deities, now we have the gorgeous uh, deities which are there here. You can see that Sunday we can leave. This very nice thing. So you, you can have the darshan as well. And you can also meet with all the devotees on Sunday. And if you come on Saturday, it's a bonus for you. You get a nice kirtan, nice prashadam, and as well as the association of all the devotees. So please consider this the weekend. Now we have a weekend bonanza for all of you. So please do come. As well as, uh, since we had a request from, from all the devotees, so we, we thought of opening the temple on weekday as well, during the, uh, in the evening. So please do come also in the evening from 6 to uh, 8.15, we are open. So anyone can come during the weekday. Uh, in, in, anyway. Sorry? Uh, the Guru Puja is in the morning. Uh, in the morning, it's, uh, it's to, uh, around 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, though, and of course, if you want to come for the morning Mangala, please let us know ahead of time. Okay? And uh, if you are interested, if you are deep in that, we can work it out also. For that. But in the evenings, for sure, those who, those who want to come in the evening, the evening, evening versions are also possible. We can come in a regular way how we used to have, like you know, the normal uh, weekends. So we are trying to have normal uh, uh, temple opening uh, in the evenings. Today, today's feast is sponsored by R.O. James' father uh, on the R.O. James' 19th birthday. So we would like to wish him in our traditional way by chanting one Hare Krishna Mahamudra. So please join with me in chanting one Hare Krishna Mahamudra for R.O. James. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, we show very happy birthday, Aravya Prabhu. We are having our, the most important festival of the entire year, which is coming up two weeks from now, on Thursday, March 17th. So please do not miss that. Mark your calendar and please do come on that day. We have so many kirtanas lined up on that day. We are going to have uh, Abhishek, just like what we had for the Nitan Prevish. And we, we are having a very gorgeous outfit on that day. Uh, just revealing some of some facts uh, for that day. Uh, so that, that will be a temptation for you to come. The version will be opulent as much as possible. We try to pour our heart to so have a wonderful version on that day. So please do come that. And also the Abhishek will be pretty grand. And as well as you see that we will have a nice, wonderful kirtan right from. Uh, at six o'clock up to nine o'clock. So that's the uh, added uh, devotion is charged uh, evening uh, on Thursday, March 17th. It's a working day. We understand that, but please make uh, make it possible. I know that you can work your schedule around and so that you can come on that day. Okay, because that's because a girl program comes once in a year. And since for the last three years, we could not get this opportunity to try to make the most of this uh, for him. Thank you once again for coming today on the Sunday is uh, program. So we hope to see you again uh, back next next Sunday, next Saturday and Sunday. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Now either you can take the Prashadam to go, but we'll also be able to have the 8 30 Kirtan, the Shain Army. So please, if, if anybody is inspired to stay, until that point of time, please feel free. And anybody if you who wants to do the season at, at night, yeah, we are welcome to have uh, the Buddhist season uh, late in the night. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and also, the Buddhist, those who are interested in doing any services, please let us know. We can help you uh, in uh, engaging in different kinds of services at the temple. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you.